All right, my friends, so year-end tax planning time is here, and uh, I think a lot of people get too caught up in the only thing, which is capital loss harvesting, and, and there's so much more than that, so much more than that. What capital loss harvesting is simple is that you, you buy, I don't know, 100 shares of GE for 10 bucks. We'll just use that for an example. You wake up nine months later, it's trading at five, and so you sell it. And you have a capital loss of whatever that is, 100 times five, was that 5,000 bucks or 500 bucks? I guess 500 bucks. And you can write that off uh, up against $3,000 of, uh, of ordinary income, or you can offset some other capital gains that you have. That's called capital loss harvesting or tax loss harvesting. And that, that's pretty simple stuff. And I think um, some of those websites better, but I think they do that automatically. I'm not convinced that that in of itself um, is the uh, is a, the end all for tax planning. In fact, I, I know it's not. But I'm not convinced. Some of these firms they say, "Oh, we do tax loss harvesting. It's going to increase your net worth by you know X, Y, Z." I, I just I don't I don't believe that necessarily um, because you need to be doing tax loss harvesting not just at the end of the year, but certainly throughout the year. But I actually I, I don't know how Betterment does it, but I, I think there's some legitimacy to that. But there's so much more, so much more. Than tax loss harvesting. In fact, this year there isn't any. I, I mean, I don't know what is down for the year, but I looked. I did a, 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 a bare bones look at various industries and uh, ind and, and indices that are down 2019, and I didn't find hardly any. I'm sure there's a few stocks out there that get crunched. I don't know how many people own them. I don't. So there's not a lot much tax loss harvesting to do. So a lot of people say, "Well, I guess I'm done. I'll just have to pay the piper and, and be done with it." Ooh. Nothing could be further from the truth. So let's dive into this blog post I just posted this morning. And if you go to uh, heritagewealthplanning.com, uh, just heritagewealthplanning.com, and you just scroll down, and you'll see right here, don't be fooled by your tax return. So I just posted this blog post, and I want to do a video on it too because I want to go over it uh, visually as well as uh, – uh, what, I guess just the word base because I think it's so important. By the way, I just did an interview with a, a guy from M1 Finance, which I'll post later on. So I'm a big fan of M1 Finance. So if you if you get a, uh, a the desire to open an account and you click on through my link, I get paid. And what M1 Finance said as well is you open your own account uh, and you refer people to them, you can get paid as well. So pretty cool if you ask me. So if you have an M1 Finance account and you refer people to open an account uh, through your link, you can get paid as well. I, I Frankly, I can't remember how much you get paid, 50 bucks or something like that. But uh, man, I mean, every pit helps. So, all right. So this is Dateline uh, today, November 12th, 2019. Don't be fooled by your tax return. And uh, that was a little bit cloudy, but anyway, this is straight from Right Capital. Look at this 1040. Notice anything missing. All right. So we got line one, wages, salaries. Line two, taxable and tax exempt interest. Line three, dividends. Line four, IRAs, pensions, and annuities, of which how much is taxable. Line five, social security. And then line six, total income. Hmm, interesting. Anything, anything jump out at you from the income sources? Hmm, interesting. Let's keep going down. No, that's okay. Let's throw some numbers in there and see if any, now anything looks odd. All right, so here we got... Uh, zero for wages, but we do have 23000 roughly of interest, of which $462 is, uh, we have $462 of tax-exempt interest. So basically $23,000 of taxable interest. Uh, we have $8,362 of ordinary dividends, of which $7,100 is uh, qualified. Nothing for IRAs, nothing for Social Security. And so our total income is $96,869. We take away our standard deduction. Whoa, wait a second. Wait a second, Josh. Wow, well, your right capital is wrong. It's $96,000 of total income, but only $30,000 here in terms of the, the, the litany of different income sources. What is going on here? Right capital is wrong, I tell you. The 1040 is wrong. Josh, you're wrong. What is happening here? Interesting, huh? So let's keep going down. We, we, uh, we'll show you here. Where are the capital gains? Where are the capital gains? None. There's no capital gains. There's no line for capital gains on the 1040. Now, next year, according to my better half, who works for a CPA firm, is that the IRS is in the uh, the beginning of adding a capital gain line to the 1040, which they should. But this year, there isn't any. And we'll see if that comes out. It's just right now in the beginning stages of it. 
So where are the capital gains? Well, we look at schedule one for the critical information regarding capital gains. And what we'll see here, if we look at schedule one, we'll see taxable refunds, album received, business income or loss, which is schedule C, which I'll have info there for me as a self-employed person. But then we got capital gain right there, line 13. I, I don't know why line 13 is uh, thrown in additional income or adjustments to income. It should never have. It should have been another line item here. But you know, be it as it may, there it is. It's hidden from you. You see they have $65,000 of total capital gains, but nothing shows here on the, on the front page of the 1040. Nothing. And so basically we're saying, well, we got $30,000 of total income, but we have $96,000 of AGI. Well, because we have 60, roughly $6,000 of capital gains. Now we look at uh, the Schedule D. So this is uh, Schedule 1. All right, now we go to Schedule D, and it shows us how much is short-term, 6,500, and how much is long-term, if we go down to Schedule Part 2 of Schedule D, 59,000. So their total capital gain consists of 65,000 bucks, roughly, of which 60,000 is short, is long, and 5,000 or so is short. All right, so that's why you got to understand your 1040 isn't all there is. There is a lot of money in capital gains, 65000 bucks. But if you only looked at the first page of the 1040, you would be ignorant of that. You would say, this looks wrong to me, as I've heard a number of people say. All right, so now let's keep going now. After a look at line 15 from above, the tax, and the, yeah, if we scroll down up here, now watch this. How much taxes did the guy pay or the taxpayer pay? $369, $369 in total income on $96,000 of total income. $369 of total taxes on $96,000 of income. Because they're married filing jointly, they got $69,000 of taxable income. They're still in the 12% bracket, which means all this right here is tax-free. All that's tax-free and so isn't this right here 7108 and qualified dividends because they're still in the 12 percent bracket nuts now let's throw some social security in there we're gonna have a making forty five thousand dollars in social security between the husband and wife everything else is the same all right so we had what did we have before we had uh ninety six thousand dollars of agi scroll down here to the new track with forty five thousand social security now they got $107,000 of AGI. So that $45,000 of Social Security only increased their taxable, uh, their AGI by $10,000. bucks. is not that interesting? Uh, <laughs> huh? Uh, that's weird. They got $45,000 more of income, and it only increases their AGI by $10,000. bucks. But look at taxable income. Taxable income is now $80,000, whereas before... It was sixty-nine thousand dollars. So that so while their AGI went up by ten thousand, so did their taxable income, which puts them in a twenty-two percent tax bracket. Which means some of these qualified dividends, some of these uh, uh, long-term capital gains would be subject to income tax. So now their taxes went up from three hundred sixty-nine thousand uh, dollars, three hundred sixty-nine dollars to forty-five thirty-eight, a twelve times, or was that one thousand two hundred percent increase in taxes? even though they only had a, uh, a small increase in AGI and taxable income, because now they have to pay money uh, taxes on the capital gains and they have to pay taxes on more income and they have to pay taxes on qualified dividends. Crazy, right? So again, if we look at what the, the tax form looked before, $69,000 before Social Security of taxable income, you can hear Pablo back there playing with some toys. $96,000 of AGI, $69,000 of taxable income, add $45,000 of Social Security, $107,000 of taxable of AGI, $80,000 of taxable income. Their taxes went from $369 to $4,538. Now, I, a lot of people say, well, that's not that bad. I mean, I increased my income by $45,000, and I only increased my taxes by $4,000. That's only a 9% tax you know, increase, essentially. Uh, 9% tax hit on the $45,000 of income I've made. And I'm actually in the 22% uh, the tax bracket. So that's not so bad. Well, the problem is if we keep going down, we'll see uh, that it, it could be a lot better. Um, and, and this is where I just want to be very, very clear. So they're in a 22% tax bracket, but they only pay 10%. Uh, that's because the I, uh, tax uh, long-term capital gains and Social Security are tax favorable for sure. But it could be so much better. Watch this. All right. So here we got rid of Social Security. All right. 
Uh, we have still taxable interest of $22,000. We have ordinary dividends or total dividends of 8,000 bucks, but you'll see no taxes here whatsoever. No taxes. We've got 22,000, 23,000. So we still got that 30 odd thousand dollars of, of dividends and interest. Uh, but then we get our standard deduction of 27,000 bucks. Our taxable income is only $4,000. But even with that, we have no taxes. And the reason for that is because we're using the specific identification method in which to uh, identify shares to sell. So if you have shares that are trading at a loss or even to your cost basis, you specifically identify those to sell so that way you don't have to pay capital gains tax on them. And because of that, we have no capital gains, but we still have income. We still were able to sell shares, but we don't have to pay capital gain because we sold the shares that are trading at cost or below we don't, or, or above cost. We have no taxable gains whatsoever. We can still use the proceeds and spam. And of course, uh, so we, that's, that is the big issue of specific identification. I linked to a uh, article with Vanguard. They say specific identif and a, and a identification method, the rigorous cost basis rec record keeping method could help you uh, reap the greatest tax benefits if you're willing to put in the time. It, it really isn't that all time consumption. I'm just not, I'm just telling you. So, and I give an example here. For instance, five years ago, you bought 100 shares of XYZ for 35. Two years ago, you bought more, but this time the price was 50. The stock is now trading at 45. You specifically identify the shares from two years ago, which is at $50, meaning not only do you pay no capital gain tax on selling those 100 shares, but you also have a loss, which you can use to offset other income. And of course, there is no Social Security uh, income here. So in this case, they can spend all the money they want as long as they don't have to go into their cost basis uh, into capital gains and uh, not pay any tax because they're literally selling it at loss or a principal back at just uh, no return. And because they're $22,000, $23,000 of interest, uh, plus their $8,300 of ordinary dividends, uh, are all the $8,300 of ordinary dividends are, uh, of which long term qualified dividends are $7,100, those are taxed at 0% because they're still in the 10 or 12% tax bracket which means this taxable interest gets offset by their standard deduction. So the only thing they got left over is $4,800 of taxable income, but that's taxed at 15%. I mean, uh, less than uh, tax at zero because they're in the 10 to 12% tax bracket. It's awesome. Uh, so specific identification is so valuable. Right now, this taxpayer is living off shares, of, selling shares at a loss or at a cost of, uh, in dividends and interest. And as such, taxable <coughs> income keeps them below the 22 tax bracket and thus they pay no tax on qualified dividends or long-term capital gains, but now they have no long-term capital gains. Their taxable interest and ordinary dividends are eaten up by the, uh, uh, by the standard deduction as well, which is sweet. Uh, let's add back in Social Security. So here we got that $45,000 of Social Security, but again, we're using specific identification to identify the specific shares to sell. So again, we have no capital gains to report on uh, the 1040 on the Schedule 1 or Schedule D. So we still have the $30,000 of taxable interest and in, uh, in dividends. Uh, now we got $45,000 of Social Security, of which 14, eh, about $15,000 taxable. So that gives us AGI, $46,000. Standard deduction of $27,000. Our taxable income is $19,051. And essentially, we got $1,100, roughly $1,200 of taxes. $1,200 of taxes on essentially, what's that? I mean, we're talking a significant amount of money. Uh, that's not so bad. Um, and I just want to go back. Oh, yeah, so let's, let's keep going down. Uh, so they got, uh, so we go notice that only a little bit of their Social Security is subject to tax uh, just because there isn't that much of other income when it comes to provisional income. Um, all right, so notice on line, four, uh, line 5B, only 14,018 of their Social Security benefits taxable, and even this is unacceptable. Just some basic asset location strategies would reduce the income on lines 2 and 3. Again, you put bonds in your IRAs. You have no dividend paying stocks in your taxable account. You have dividend paying stocks in your Roth and whatnot. And that would have eliminated a good work, a good amount of this income, which is taxable, which has caused them 1100 bucks in taxes, but that's not that bad. Uh, and, and which is also making some of their social security taxable too, I'll, I'll, I'll add. And great work, taxpayers. But for now, let's just pause and admire the great work these taxpayers have created. Over 100K in income and yet only paying 1100 bucks in taxes. It's a thing of beauty. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm hearing someone from the peanut gallery. What's that? I can't hear you. You need to yell louder. 
Oh, you're screaming that I'm misleading people because specific identification doesn't eliminate capital gains. It only defers them. Aye, ye of little faith. If you use specific identification to sell your high basis, low gain shares and are left with low basis, high gain shares, what do you do next? Do you sell those taxable shares? Well, now if you can afford it, you leave those shares to your heirs because of the step up basis. So now you have a low basis, high gain stock. You give that to old Johnny down the street, uh, you know, little Johnny. He inherits that stock and he pays no capital gains tax because of step up rules and you pay no capital gains tax because you haven't sold it. And that's what I'm trying to say. The tax code is a beautiful thing for what you see it as. It's a puzzle that is needed to be solved. But if you aren't paying attention, you will be fooled. And thus, you'll pay more tax, which I think is by design. So I hope that helps you, my friends. I'll put a link to the show notes for this blog piece. It, obviously, you, some people read it better than others. Some people understand it more visually. And some people understand it more audio. I'm a little bit more visual, but uh, hope you find this helpful and informative. Watch your taxes, man. Do some diligence to make sure you're not getting hammered. All right, we'll see you next time.